Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Robin Pollock. I am your inveterate moderator tonight. And I, you see next to me the lovely and talented Marilyn Hersicorn, who will be giving our talk tonight. I just want to give my little spiel about For Homeopathy Canada. We are a uh, group of people, of uh, mainly homeopaths and some people in the community as well who absolutely love homeopathy. We understand its value to the world and to our community. And we would like to help people understand about how it works and the wonders of it. And we love to do it through an education platform. So we are dedicated to teaching you as much as we can about homeopathy for to know when you can use it at home for yourselves in like first aid situations, little acute situations, colds, waking up in the middle of the night with a bad cough, stuff like that. And also to know when to go and visit a homeopath proper, somebody who has gone through the proper training uh, in order to get a treatment for more difficult situations. So tonight we're doing something we've never done before. Let's go on to the next slide. Marilyn, I'm so excited that we were able to find uh, somebody and somebody who's so educated in this area in something called agro-homeopathy, the non-chemical gardening using homeopathic remedies. Now, as a lot of you know, uh, many of the homeopathic remedies are made from plants. It's one of the divisions. We do plants, animals, and minerals. And we also do something else called imponderables, which is based on energy. But we've never had anyone come and talk to us specifically about something like this. So let me just tell you a little bit about Marilyn. She has been interested in natural health for more than 20 years. And she studied education and botany at the University of British Columbia. And that's where she is right now, with areas of interest that she has frequently utilized in teaching adult education and course uh, courses, and also something called wildcraft classes. And I have to tell you, Marilyn, I had to look that up. And wildcraft, for those of you like me with a black thumb, means gathering herbs, plants, and fungi from the wild. Her botany training has also enhanced her love of gardening and her appreciation of remedies in the plant kingdom. So Marilyn was introduced to homeopathy by her naturopath after being, and I quote, stuck in the quagmire of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. I think a lot of people can recognize that. And following her lifelong quest for learning, she soon joined a beginner study group on homeopathy. And eventually she started formal study at the Vancouver Homeopathic Academy, graduating in 2003. And in her final year, Marilyn developed a collection of remedy learning aids that she later expanded into the book, Pictographica Homeopathica, which was published in 2006. So let's go on to the next slide. I know a lot of you are going to want to know about this book and how to spell it. So I'm going to let you have a few seconds writing that down. Um, and um, Marilyn, I think, is going to talk a little bit about it at the end. But this was her graduation thesis. How great was that, that she was able to put together her love, what she does and her art and all of that, and aids to studying Materia Medica. Um, and she published it into a book. So Marilyn welcomes inquiries about homeopathy and how it can be of benefit to you and your family for a wide range of conditions. So I'm going to let Marilyn take the reins, but I just want to remind everybody, oh, Judy says it's a great book. I have no doubt it's a great book. I was trying to find it online, but Marilyn will talk about that at the end. So uh, everybody who has questions, I would encourage you to put it into the Q&A. You see that on your screen. Uh, you could put it in the chat, but you run the risk of me losing sight of it because it does scroll. So try to put it into the Q&A. If it's something that I think is pertinent to what we're talking about that minute, I will interrupt Marilyn, but otherwise we'll do as many as of them as we can at the end. So I think I've said all I need to say. I'm delighted, thrilled, thrilled, happy. We are so happy at 4HC, very grateful to Marilyn and uh, everybody have a great time and I'll see you guys at the end. Okay, next slide. Oops, too many. Hi everybody. Um, this is my first doing a webinar. So it's an experiment for me. We'll be doing an introduction to non-chemical gardening using homeopathic remedies. About me, I was born and raised in the land of the Northern Lights and the Midnight Sun in Canada's far north, up near Alaska. With a university background in education, biology, and zoology, it left the door open for other adventures. Soon, the alternative approach to health presented itself in studies of body alignment technique, which is applied kinesiology, aligning the mental, the emotional, and the physical bodies. 
and a year and a half of years of study under a grandmaster of Qigong. It was quite grueling, but very educational. And homeopathy, a part of the book, Pictographica Homeopathica, was created for my homeopathic graduation, graduating thesis. And my latest adventure has been German New Medicine, the interrelationship between disease and traumatic emotions. Uh, this has been a real eye-opener and something I think everybody should study. So with agrohomeopathy, we're seeking to minimize or eliminate the use of toxic chemicals on the plants, as well as behold the power of homeopathic remedies in treating plant health issues and encourage green healing in the garden. So using chemical sprays on food crops has disadvantages. There may be chemical residue on the foods we ingest. There could be an overspray that could be carried on the wind affecting native plants, insects, or other crops in the area. And chemical sprays may impact insects, thus reducing pollination, crop size, and crop quality. Agrohomeopathy is a green alternative. Here we have a glossary of terms used in homeopathy and which I'll be referring to within this presentation. A nozode is a homeopathic remedy made from diseased tissue, the product of disease or from the pests themselves. I actually just recently made up the nozode that will be covered a little bit later on. Pills or pillules are small white sugar globules onto which a homeopathic remedy has been sprayed. Potency is the power, the vitality, the strength, or the dynamis that a homeopathic remedy possesses, such as Arnica 200C or Silica 30C. A remedy is a medicine which relieves or cures a disease. A repertory is an index of symptoms derived from the Materia Medica and from cl clinical data. Sclerophyllus rubbery leaves such as those on orcas. Succus, the process of potentization, giving the properly diluted homeopathic remedy a vigorous shaking with an impact. So in the agrohomeopathy treatment protocol, we are going to assess the plant, which is listing observations, the extent of the disease or infection, and any other things that, that we're going to notice about that. So I, I keep tabs and write everything down. So we'll be looking at some of that too. Name or identify the observed plant ailment, a fungus, a canker, an insect infest infestation, or pruning damage, etc. Then take the case and select the best fit homeopathic remedy with reference to the available materia medica. Treating the ill plant, preparation and application of a selected remedy, and evaluate the response and the efficacy. So maybe repeat the remedy, modify what remedy you use, or maybe the plant either can't be saved or we end it because we're satisfied with the results that we have. So we're looking at the plant ailment. An example of plant candidates for homeopathic treatment with attention to damage from insects, such as aphids and scale, fungus, can cancer, etc., in relation to the leaves, which you can often see fungus, blight, caterpillars on the leaves. Flowers may have very poor pollination or even no pollination. The fruit could be very deformed, have scab or other fungal diseases as well as pest diseases. Um, branches, tree trunks, could be cancers, injury, and pruning damage. So signs of a healthy, vigorous plants to strive for is that feel good aura. Now taking the plant's case and choosing a remedy. So we're going to look at the plant and assess it and keep records. And with the available materia medica reference resources, we will search out what 
remedy hopefully we can find. Selecting and attaining the best homeopathic remedy to fit the case. And we're going to look at a fruit salad tree in Kelowna, which is southern British, central southern British Columbia, the fruit growing area for British Columbia, Canada. So in record keeping, we've got, I've got several examples here for them. We're looking at two of an apple tree scab and cankers or cancers. The rose bush, black leaf spot, which is a fungus, and an orchid in my house with a scale on the leaf. The scale is an insect. There's always other things yet to be tried, other aphids, caterpillars, other uh, potential challenges for us. So here is my record keeping. My husband very kindly made up the spreadsheets for me. He's the computer whiz. So I keep the, the date down one column and the next column I either will make a comment or put in the remedy I've used. And the far right, the um, scab or cancer that I was trying to address or any other notes that, that I have. So early April, this is from 2020. And my apple tree, or I've got four apple trees, but this is uh, the, you see, number five. This is the far east one. So the anyway, we've, we have many cancers on this. It's a very, very old tree. And we had a particularly cold winter. So there was a lot of shock and trauma just from the cold as well as the pruning. So arnica was needed for the shock trauma for the events there. Then I looked at carcinocinum for the scab and cankers, and then through you to give it another boost for the scab and cankers. And by early June, the new apples were looking pretty healthy, and the tree was supporting a larger crop than usual. No remedy needed. By late June, in that, in that particular tree, observations only. Crows, something removed, 25 small perfect apples. One apple remains. Late June, at the same time, I would use natrium sulfuricum. And around this time, I decided to bag the apples. So we'll review that a little later on too. And then September, observations only, still two apples remaining. I actually did find two more hidden amongst the leaves and the branches. So the bottom left is one of the apples from our tree, the scab. I did not uh, bag all of them. Uh, to prevent the disease, but I wanted to show you what scab looks like. It can invade the entire apple. There's, there's circular spots on it that grow and grow throughout the whole summer. So sometimes when you cut the apple open, the scab disease, the fungal disease is right into the core. All our apples for the last number of years had to go straight into the green bin, but they could not be used. They were hard, they did not ripen, they were covered with scab, they looked ugly, we, we wouldn't want to eat them. The center picture is a branch from a plum tree showing a cancer. And the far right are some of our healthy apples. This is our little uh, sour cherry tree, Morello sour cherry. And this is showing a cancer. The bark is split and you can actually see the core wood underneath. It's in bloom, uh, it's just finished blooming. It's now in, in small cherries. It's it developed the nickname, the pit tree, because all we were getting year after year was pits with skin. So it still is called the pit tree, even though we're now starting to get some beautiful uh, crops of cherries, even though it's a sick tree, but the homeopathic remedies uh, revitalized it. Keeping records as well, we, we, I noted in, in my uh, record keeping that bagging of the apples to guard against disease and insects as well as theft and damage from birds and squirrels. And often we will get bird pecks in the apples and squirrels will cart some off and eat a quarter of the apple before we find it lying on the ground somewhere. So now we're going to look at bagging your apples after spraying. So you're going to want to do your sprays first and then do all the work of bagging. And let's let the spray dry. So purchase sandwich bags with a Ziploc closure. Cut the bottom quarters off the bag so it looks like a pair of underpants. So you can see on the bottom, it snipped away, that part. Uh, that allows air in 
It allows any water that might get into the bag to drain away. And midway along the top, make a cut through the Ziploc, leaving room for the apple stem. So you can see that at the top where the green is, I've snipped away. Slide the bag over the apple and snap the Ziploc closed on both sides of the cut, right up to the apple stem. This is not the apple tree branch, it's the apple stem of the apple. This will protect your apples from scab, from squirrels, and from birds. Uh, last summer, we actually found two apples still in their bags on the lawn in places that they no way could they have got there by themselves. So obviously, squirrels have climbed the tree and tried stealing the apples. But one of the bags definitely had squirrel teeth marks on it. So it left the bag uh, and the apple because it couldn't get in. So we enjoyed our apple too. I learned that one from my chiropractor. Here's a little more record keeping. My East Rose bush, it's a very, very old bush. Uh, it's probably from the 1960s, possibly even older than that. We would have got it the mid 1970s. So late May, I used Cooper Metallicum for the leaf black spot. So you're seeing some of that on the bottom uh, left picture. The black spot is a little bit more the center leaf, the very top, where it's uh, a little starburst. The rest of this is another fungus. I, that's his mouth out. That's a book I'll do a review on. No change from that one. So by early June, I use Roost Tox. Again, the same, the leaf black spot. And the far right were the new leaves after they've been treated. Very cold and wet spring. I had great results, huge results. I made a rose leaves nosode, so that's picking up all the leaves, the plant that drop the diseased leaves, and sprout new ones, which would promptly get the disease, and they would fade and drop, which would probably get more new leaves. This went on all summer. So that's why I collected all the diseased leaves, and I made up a nosode from the diseased leaves. Well, we do that one too. Uh, late September, I used silica. So I put in little notes because I, I did a whole pile of trees with silica at that time. So I sprayed the, the puny apple tree, the sour cherry, the old rose bush, because they all needed more vigor. They were all really quite weak. These, these are the leaves now in the rose bush that we just took the picture two days ago. Tasty bug certified rose leaves. So you can see the hole. A few others have even a bigger hole. I never had insects eating on the rose leaves before because they were covered in fungus and I really didn't like them. So these are now my new crop of leaves. They're doing really well. I've noticed a little bit of the disease that's coming back. That is just, I have two spots with this. But you see how they're like starbursts and they will cover the leaf. The leaf will die, drop off, and also, you can see where the far right lower one was also tasty at one time to a bug as well. Now we're looking at creating the nosode remedy that we could treat rose black spot. Sure, the remedy that I used worked really well. But I thought, hmm, I wonder if one made from a nosode would do a great job. So let's experiment. So I collected all the leaves as they fell throughout the summer and uh, put them aside and dried them. Then my husband got the torch out to burn them. So they're ash. So the burned leaves, if you look to the far right, to the right picture at the top, far right of that, you, you can almost imagine a little stem from the rose leaf that's still hanging in there after the burning. Then I put a, the uh, ash into a mortar and pestle and ground it up. Presto, there are the ashes that then have to go through a dilution process. So from the, uh, from the burnt leaves, we can make a 10, 10x nozzle, which is what I did. The rose ash has been stored for a year, because I did that last fall. 
Now that the rose is exhibiting the black spot fungal disease, it's time to test this nozo's efficacy. But the, the black spot only just arrived a few days ago after a really big heavy rain. So lactose milk sugar powder was purchased from the pharmacy in preparation for the trituration. Into the mortar was placed one eighth of a teaspoon of the very fine ash from the dried, burned and pulverized diseased rose leaves. The X potency will require a nine to one ratio. Often you hear uh, one to 10, or no, one, to, one to nine, one to 10, um, but nine plus one is 10. So it really is a one to nine ratio. One part ashes, nine parts of lactose powder. Uh, in old alchemy, the process is to grind or stir for six minutes to the right, clockwise, then grind or stir for six minutes to the left, anti-clockwise. This sets up the energies. I got this information from a very talented homeopath. So with each level of potency, the contents were put up into small containers for storage. One part was retained for the mortar and nine parts of lactose were added. This was repeated 10 times to achieve a 10X. So I have each potency one to 10. I wrote to Homeopathy Plus, references will be later on for that, in Australia for the next solution into water. They suggested to use one teaspoon in one liter of water, making this an 11X remedy. Then I succussed it and sprayed it. So Sikust was there again, shake vigorously, and went out and sprayed the rose last night. So we'll see what happens. Marilyn, may I interrupt you for mm -hmm. a second? Sure. We've, we've had two of the same question. Um, and uh, if I can get their names, so you can, let me see, Amy and Jody both asked, why did you burn the leaves to make a no-sode instead of soaking in alcohol? I didn't even think about soaking in alcohol for one. Um, and you can just take the leaves and dry them and grind them. But my thought was, since I really was just going to go to an X, I didn't think I'd go into the seas, would there still be some of the actual disease left? So it, I also, the book that I will be reviewing uh, is by Mauta, and she's in Germany. And she says to dry them and uh, burn them and then grind them. So I decided I'm going to follow her process. So other than that, I don't have any other reason for why I did what I did. Okay? That's um, great, thanks so much. Yes, you're welcome. Um, next one. So a little more record keeping. The far left is one of the orchids. I have a dozen orchids and when, one year, uh, one of my husband's friends, he's a magnificent orchid grower, he says, well, why don't you put all your orchids outside for the summer, out onto your deck? Well, I did that once, never do it again. Since then, I've never been able to totally get rid of the scale. So there are two little scales on the edge of that leaf. They are often a little bit more sneaky. They will usually be on the underside of the leaves, down in the crotch where the leaves are just growing fresh so you can't see them, or even on the underside of the plant in where the, the roots are growing down into the bark. And it's not until you're repotting them that you find, oh, this little devil, <laughs> it's snuck its way down into there too. Uh, so anyway, I marked his book, showed to use petroleum 30C. So I make my little rep notes on my, my uh, diaries, mount of page 41. So that way I know where I got the information and I can go back and always read it again. So scale on the, uh, on the orchid, located in the south kitchen window. And uh, I use six pills and 150 mils of water. This is Christiana Mouta's technique. Six pills and 150 mils of water. Take succusset, put 25 mils into two liters, succusset, and then spray. Uh, I now adapt that a little bit. Um, the petroleum, did not eradicate the scale. In fact, I had more scale than I had before. So, okay, what to do? Go back to what I had been doing before. And um, this again was told to me by the same guy that told me to put my plants outside. 
oh, well, use Dawn dish detergent in water. Well, probably some of you in other countries may not know the Dawn dish detergent. I think it's Palmolive, it's a brand. And uh, the one he was referring to is blue in color, probably just a dye, I'm, I'm guessing. But it is the Dawn dish detergent that was used in the um, great Valdez oil spill up at Alaska with so many birds that were affected uh, with the oil. And so they were using the, the Dawn dish detergent for cleaning these birds. And so, yes, I'm using it now for getting rid of scale as well as any other insects. So houseplants, orchids with scale. Scale is an insect. There is a minute mobile part to the scale. Thus, they can travel to other nearby plants, undetected because they are so tiny. The adult part of the scale has a firm circular house attached to a leaf or a stem or even inside a flower. On the orchids, especially any of my yellow orchids, the, the pale scale, which you can see on the left there, will hide really well into a yellow orchid. So on the orchids, they may be on the underside of the leaf, under the plant where you can't see it, in where the roots begin, and they are sneaky. So whenever I'm cleaning around the area, if I find, oh, there's a sticky spot on the counter, that means I have scale. So sticky honeydew is released by the scale. And it's a, good, it's a sign that definitely you have scale on your plants, unless some other insects maybe also produce a scale, a, a sticky honeydew. I then take the plants outside on a warm day to do the spraying. I put up um, two sawhorses and a big plank, put all the orchids out there. I tried the petroleum 30C, but it rolled off the thick leathery leaves. This experiment was a failure. I had more scale afterwards than before. So as taught by an orchid grower, I used one or two drops of Blue Dawn dish detergent in a small hand sprayer. Wonderful, amazing success. No scale for at least eight months. Blue Dawn dish detergent and the Valdez Alaska oil scale, they go together. So that's how you can remember it. So I would think that any, um, any good di dish detergent, one or two drops in, a wa in water, and you just need a small hand sprayer to do your house plants, not, not a big pump sprayer. Then uh, so I put a little suggestion down the bottom. I could always try spraying the Dawn dish detergent in the water plus the petroleum 30C remedy. Why not do a double whammy, see how it works. Now we're heading to central south British Columbia not too far north of the US border. And uh, my, my daughter has a fruit salad tree growing in her front yard. This is Kelowna. So we have, my husband kindly labeled the pictures here. The far left is nectarine. It, it had five fruits grafted onto one stem. The um, green gauge plum was cut away because they really did not enjoy eating the green gauge plum. So now it's a four fruit salad tree. The far left is the nectarine. You can see it comes from fairly low down and it is a massive branch. When I saw that one last September, there had to be at least 300 nectarines on that branch. The apricot in the center, and there's also peach, had a few fruits on it. They're, they're the, by far the tiniest branch. And the plum to the right has never had any fruit. It has had uh, pits with skin, it has had some fruit starting to go ripe and then drop off. So we've, we're looking at it and thinking, okay, the strong nectarine branch is probably pulling a large portion of the energy into itself. It's, it is the thickest branch there. The weak plum branch, branch with no fruit for three years. They even got uh, mason bees in and the mason bees do multiply and come out and do the, the, uh, the pollinating. Any fruit was just a pit of skin, hearty ripe fruit that fell off. Even mason bees have not changed the lack of fruit. What to do? So here is our question. So we're looking now at the plum twig, or <laughs> call it a twig because it's so scrawny, the plum branch symptoms. So looking at a, a repertory from Cabarage's book, there again, we'll review that. 
So in his repertory, under fruits, fruits fall early. You can see four remedies. The fruit set is poor, another four remedies. And then under the general he heading generative, there's pollination, there is uh, pistol, there's stamen, there's other ones, but pollination was defective. Uh, we don't know for sure, uh, impaired, or is the stamen immature, uh, not there to look at the flowers to, to assess them. And then general, this tree is straggling. And that particular branch, failure to thrive. So with homeopathy, we look at how many times in the repertorization that a remedy will show up. So Bovista, down at the bottom section of the analysis, Bovista shows up three times, Calcard twice, Cuprum three times, Ferrum sulfate twice, Kelly Carbonicum three times, Natrum Carbonicum three times, and Silica six. So since Silica has by far the highest score, that is the remedy we'll pick. It fits the majority of symptoms. Now we're looking at the same tree, but looking from the house out, or before we were looking towards the house. This is five fruits grafted onto one tree stem, tree stem that pruned in early April, 2021. So my picture happens just to be over the edge of that uh, nectarine, but it was so, so profuse, but it has been cut about to where the edge of the picture is there. Major cut, I don't think I would have been that brave. <laughs> That's how it got cut. The center, the apricot and peach, and uh, then the plum branch to the left. So notice the dramatic pruning of the nectar. Maybe some of the energy will now go to the prune plum. The plum, the apricot and the peach were sprayed with silica 30C. Silica is a great remedy to bolster an ailing or a weak plant. It's known as a plant tonic. So the uh, nectarine branch would have been covered up just so that it would not get any, uh, any more tonic it has enough itself. So fruit salad tree in bloom, end of April, 2021. And you can see the profuse blooms on the nectarine, uh, not as abundant on the, uh, the peach and the apricot. And so far at that point in time, the plum had no blooms. My daughter phoned a panic. It's still not blooming, everything else is blooming. So the apricot and the peach, center stems and the nectarine are blooming. The plum bloomed later, and that's what I guided her. The bees can't handle when everything is a bloom at the same time. So this enables the bees to do a more thorough job of pollinating. So sure enough, within a week, the plum was in bloom. So the plum, apricot and peach branches were sprayed with 30C, but not the nectarine. This is a picture from two days ago. Look at all the plums. So the fruit salad tree in early fruit, May 18th. This is the most fruit seen so far on this branch. Silica 30C is doing its job. If, if the plums ripen, it will be the first plum crop of this tree. Marilyn. So a lot of excitement, yes. So I'm getting lots of questions about your technique here. And I wonder, are you gonna get, tell us at the end or like people want to know, for example, did you uh, did you just spray the silica the one time? Like, what is your methodology there? What is the frequency of dose, I guess? And also, what is the ratio to dilute the silica? So that kind of thing. Um, I think I had her put it in one liter of water. It may have been she she chose a smaller hand spray, so I haven't actually seen the container but I think it's, it's closer to a liter of water for the silica 30C. And it, I probably suggested uh, two little pillules in that liter. And um, one spray, silica is one of those that you do not give a second spray. It is such a powerful plant tonic that it can actually be used as a, a weed eliminator because whatever you spray it from for, for it is going to help that plant to thrive, survive, and probably to produce abundant blooms. So for people in greenhouses, you would spray the um, basilica and you would get great bloom. If you spray it twice, you will get profuse bloom. Just if you use it for weeds, it forces the blooming of them so much that the weeds can actually die. 
So my daughter was ready to spray it and I sent a fast email. No way, don't give it a second because <laughs> you could undo all the good. So there's your guidance for silica, one spray. And just one more, and another thing they wanna know is where, uh, Leanne asked, will watering the roots at the base of the plants instead of foliage spraying be just as effective a delivery method of the remedies? Okay, with this, I asked her, first of all, just spray the plant, but she decided to do the, the other two and not the nectarine, just because they too were weak. Uh, so she just did the branches, the foliage. Um, when I'm spraying my trees for cancer and that, I'm doing the ground as well. But I didn't want the nectarine to get <laughs> any extra strength to it. So I said, just do the stem and the leaves. Okay, does that answer it? That's fantastic, thanks. That's okay. perfect. Proceed on. So we're gonna do a book review of a couple books. This book is Homeopathy for Plants written by Christiana Mauta. She lives in Germany over in the Lake Constance area. This is the fourth revised edition. It's called A Practical Guide for House, Balcony and Garden Plants. Printed in 2016, 210 pages. I paid $38 plus shipping from Toronto. It's an excellent hardcover book with thick pages and very good color photos. It is set up for relatively easy usage with the more common house and garden plants. The section has remedy descriptions. There is a six page repertory, which is the symptoms list. There are some cross-referencing errors that have not been addressed in the latest revised edition. This is the continuing of the same book. Um, the shortcomings with the revisions, uh, when, when sometimes when you're reading something, there'll be see such and such, or go to page such and such, or see chapter such and such. When referred to another part of the book, that page number does not have the information sought. During revision, the new page number was not updated. When I received the book, I went through everything page by page, correcting page numbers. Also one thing, as I, especially as I was skinning quickly, it really bothered me, 10 mils in 101 water. Well, it just didn't make sense, it didn't catch my attention. So when I really look closely at it, the second one in 101 is identical, it's supposed to be an L. Then in this particular font, the number one and the letter L are identical. So I went with my art pen and I changed the second one, which there were quite a few of them, into a written L. So that now reads 10 liters of water. Not all items in the book are listed in the index. The repertory is a little shy on some entries, so could use a bit of a tune-up. There is a table of modalities. This is the causes or the triggers. Causes are listed vertically and remedies are listed horizontally. Not all remedies are listed in the book in this table of modalities for matching cause with remedy. And I have note B story. She has a most beautiful story in her book. It is of, I'm pretty sure it's a cherry tree on her property. And they noticed that the, the bees were coming to the, the tree, coming to it, not on it, to it, and stayed away but would not land on anything. And it took a while. She's obviously got good intuition. She says, it looks like the bees are nauseated. So her surmise was that in some of the fields around that had been uh, sprayed, probably some of the spray had drifted to her tree and the bees were picking up on that and, and feeling nauseated. So she treated the tree with Nux vomica. Great success. The bees went to the tree and did their job. So she is a great believer of also watering the ground. You could spray the tree, sometimes they're too tall to spray everything, but I spray what I can reach and the trunk and spray the ground as well. She will actually take a watering can and put the remedy in it and spray the ground. Uh, she doesn't say she stirs it, but I would highly recommend stirring after you put your remedy in to potentize that water. This is the next book. I have both of these. 
call it the Cabarage book, mainly because his first name is a Dutch name, 13 letters long, and nobody knows how to say it. It's not your Dutch. It's homeopathy for farm and garden, the homeopathic treatment of plants. This too is the fourth revised edition, 2015, 291 pages, a seven page repertory, and it cost me $49.25 plus shipping. Both books have been produced by Mariana Berlog, which is a German publishing company. This is a much more technical book with in-depth descriptions of plant illness, insects, weed remedies, fungal diseases, and includes treating soil problems as well as companion planting. Um, he, this is a very adventuresome person, or was a very adventuresome person who died in 2013. But he went for commercial greenhouses, he went for large acreage farms, and, and this is what he would treat. So he did a huge amount of research and we are the beneficiaries of that. So I do recommend both. Um, both books. The Moto one is, is made more for the home gardener. This one can take you to other places or if you want to know other things. This is geared for large establishments such as farms and greenhouses. Cabaret spent many years in Australia doing extensive research work on large tracts of land and working with the Australian flora. Uh, he even, I'm not sure how many acres it was, but out in the desert, was able to spray that, I think it was with silica, and came back a year later, and that's, that desert area was still holding water. For the average gardener, there is much more information than is needed. If you have a curious mind, there is lots to learn from this book, which is being translated into many languages. They're both of superb quality as well. So administering the remedy to your plant. Um, the right hand sprayer is my newest sprayer. The left hand one, you see a husband's put a nice big X there. Do not use metal with homeopathic remedies. It has the potential of antidote in them. Uh, so this is a brass sprayer, Hudson sprayer. Um, I've given it to a secondhand store. Somebody else can use it. I have used it for chemicals before. I don't want to even try cleaning it out for homeopathic remedies. So it has left our premises. So the new plastic sprayer is what I use now. And uh, so dilute your remedy and spray, apply, apply it to the ill plant. So this is six remedy pills into 150 mils of water and succuss. This is Mouta's technique. Then take 25 mils of solution into the sprayer with two liters of water. Cabarage uses one pill for 200 mils of water, and I use four pills for four liters of water, <laughs> okay? So make sure that you really agitate, shake hard, really hard. Give the, the sprayer a really good shake because this is how you're potentizing that remedy. And then keep your records, observe your plants, uh, note down your remedy and the potency and the dilutions that you used, and then all the observed results before and after, because you're going to want to look back at that a year later and say, oh, okay, got the same problem, but it worked, but it didn't hold for a really long time. And you're going to want to, to look at those things. So administering the remedy to your plant. When to spray all the little green check marks on a cloudy day, on a no wind day, at most a light breeze, early in the morning before the intense sun or towards the evening. I shy away a bit from the evening just because the plants could be wet for the night and you don't want any other mold, you won't want anything growing. So when not to spray, red X's, not on a sunny day, sun has the potential to antidote the remedy. But you could do it earlier in the day when the sun, or in the springtime too, when the sun is not intense. Not on a windy day, because it's going to drift and it could even coat you if it turns and blows on you. Not during rain or while the plant is still wet. If you live in a coastal area and your plants are always wet, well, you do what you have to do. 
you spray when you have to spray. So spray if safely and effectively. I use a hat with a brim because sometimes I'm reaching way up and it's going to shower down a little bit. So my hat is protecting me. A jacket, gloves, glasses, and plastic sprayer. Now we're looking at the efficacy. So evaluate and record things, observe things, observe the results obtained after a day, after a week, or just whenever you are out and about looking at the plants. Decide on, do I need to repeat? So do I need to get some additional or similar results or do I need to somewhat modify my remedy for even better effects? Or do I need to finish the treatment and say, hey, the plant's healthy, or maybe it could not be saved. Maybe it was beyond what even a homeopathic remedy could do. So storing homeopathic remedies. Keep the remedies in their original containers to maintain purity and effectiveness. Keep the remedies away from strong light, such as sunshine. If, to, if you wish to keep some of the leftover solution, add a bit of alcohol as a preservative, such as brandy. Ideally, store the remedies at room temperature. Keep the remedies and the solutions away from strong smelling substances. Remember, they really are very delicate. So this is Caparage, one pill to 200 mils of water. I'm just giving uh, some remedies here and what they could be used for. Arnica, a tonic for all plants. Shock, trauma, pruning, transplanting, injuries. Calendula, also similar to Arnica. Pruning, transplanting shock. You can use it for ants, mechanical damage, for weak plants. Carbo Veg, the corpse reviver. I have used this on my plants with a cancer. Plants in collapse, dying, slow recovery, after transplant, from injuries, tomato blight. The whole plant will collapse with tomato blight. Graphitis, cracks in the skin. The skin is the bark. So if you're seeing cracks in it, you might want to try thinking about graphitis, the part, bark peeling back, fungal diseases. This is a potent remedy. Silicea, it aids seed germination. So after seeding, you could lightly spray the area and uh, it hopefully should aid seed germination. Tonic for all plants, for shock, it increases flower growth. Now remedy usage according to the ailment. So I'm looking at other things here. I'm looking at aphids, fruit flies, white flies, silverfish. So the coccinella septunctata is C-O-C-C-S. That is the little ladybug, the little red ladybug that does eat aphids. I saw one yesterday on my tree. And semifuga. Simif the apple scab, you could use allium sepa or zinc. Cancer, you could use carbo veg. Carcinocinum, I have a little white dog visiting me, a nose ode, Staphysagria, sulfur, Rephelia. On my sour cherry, the, the, it gets Manilia fruit rot, uh, use Carbo Veg, Thuria, and Carcinocinum. So, fungal diseases, you could think about Carbo Veg, Cupra Metallicum, Natrum Sulfuricum, Silica, Rephelia. Insects, Think of mothballs. Mothballs stink because they have camphor in them. So camphora is a marvelous remedy for insects. Even though it's so dilute, there is no odor, they can pick up on the discomfort. And they, tip, they pack their bags and leave. Premature fruit drop, Actea racemosa, sepia, rose leaf, black spot, Loose talks work really well for me. Now I'm trying the rose nose ode. Slugs and snails. You could use Helix Toaster, which is the toasted um, snail shell that's then made into a remedy. And tomato blight. You could use carbo veg or silica. 
and resources. In Germany, this is a little quote, for online collaboration in your language with others who are also interested in agrohomeopathy, visit the Homeo Plant Forum at www.homeoplant.com. For Australia, if you would like help with your garden or farm problem, email Cabarage at editor at homeopath, homeopath, homeopathyplus.com.au. And to use the repertory free of charge, go to homeopathyplus.com forward slash agrohomeopathy dash repertory. And thank you for your interest in greening and, and our gardening care and questions and discussion time. All righty. Well, I think you just answered a whole bunch of questions with that last slide with especially the repertory and how to contact Kaviraj because pe yeah, pe yeah, I, now yeah. I figured people need a, a contact. Yes, they do. People need a call. So needless to say, I've just like been at the edge of my seat listening to this. Um, just so many interesting things in there that, so I just want to thank you very much. Uh, finally, we might have a way of you know, dealing with our plant issues. And I'm wondering also, gee, maybe I should spray some camphora in my kitchen because we have ants every year. And maybe that, you know, does that make any sense to you? It nope. does. Yes. And and if you sign up actually for the uh, newsletter at the editor at homeopathyplus.com, um, my last one came through without the .au. So you could try it without the .au, just editor at homeopathyplus.com or .com .au. And, and, I think most might get there, but they answer a lot of questions. They were really good. I didn't know what to do with my um, my 10x rose um, rose remedy, uh, and so I, I emailed them. Said, "How much do I use of that in how much water?" And so they got back to me within about four or five days. They and when, very, when you say they, because people are saying that Kaviraj has died. Kaviraj has died, but somebody has taken over. And answering his questions. He died in 2013, yes. But you can, in Australia, there's this one homeopathic office. They sell remedies and they will answer your questions. Fantastic. How you access them, yes. So, speaking of answering questions, do you have time for a few? Sure. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, you're talking a, a lot about how to save uh, plants. Uh, but um, Linda had questions about what, what happens if you have weeds and, and even rats. I don't I don't know if your if if your area is rats right now. But she did ask that question. Do you have any suggestions for when you want to get rid of something? Uh, like a pest, you mean? Yeah. And so that I would ask the editor at homeopathyplus.com in Australia, because Cavarage has all of that stuff listed, and they will feed back to you. Camp Four might have, but I don't. Read I did read a newsletter with the rats and I don't remember what they did use. Any Anything, uh, somebody's just mentioning in Ontario, we have gypsy moths and caterpillars. Does that ring a bell for you on anything? Um, no, because we don't have them here. So I, I did, wasn't addressing those specifically. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'll try to see but people, you know, people get so excited about what you're doing that they go a bit out of the lane yeah, quite a few will be in Cavarage's book and there might be some of that in uh, Mauta's book as well can you give a little help with repertorization like an example Linda asked Linda Lata asked I have a Japanese maple that has a large crack in the bark of the lowest part of the trunk near the soil it's not doing well how would I repertorize this so yeah, I, I would yeah, I recommend, uh, let me see now, it's often in categories, so I'll, I'll go to Cavarage's repertory here, repertory, and so it's in, in categories, capillary, cause, epidermis, flowers, fruits, general, generative, leaves, so generative, I use my daughter's plum tree in that, modalities, named diseases, um, nutrients, pests, roots, seed, stem and grain, water requirement, and weeds. So those are the categories that he has set up. So you need to go to the appropriate category and that would have to be bark. So is that general, it's shriveled. 
so I'm not yeah. stem. Yeah, that's true. Stem name diseases. Just like our regular repertory, you kind of have to know the archaic language or this. You do. Here's stem and grain. So bark dry and harsh, chalky, lodging, rot, swollen, tillering. So it, it doesn't have the cracking of it. Um, carcinosinum. Um, and what else was I using? Mm. I'll have to write you with what I was using with that. Somebody's mentioning epidermis as a possible place to look. That's correct, yes. All right, good. Um, when you were talking about this Cilicia, can you, uh, Aaron Wonders, can you use it once a year if needed or even once ever? Could, that could be a dosage for it? Well, once a year is quite fine. But don't do two sprays close together, not even a month apart. You, you want some time in there. It's, it's such a powerful remedy. That's so that uh, that falls right into Amy's question, which is what about residual effect of one remedy on the next remedy when you use it? How do you, and also some people were asking, can you use the same container for different remedies? I don't, or I do, actually, I do use the same container, but after I've used it, I put water in it and very gently rotate and gently slosh and and pour it out and often I'll use really hot water because heat can destroy a remedy as well. So I want it and, and I'll pump it up and then spray through the sprayer to clean the hose as well before I use the next remedy. Okay so you don't feel that it retains the memory of the previous remedy or you don't know? I don't think the container will but you, you do want to give a because otherwise you're potentizing what's left in there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you, you want to even try to dry it out a little bit if you can. You, it's just do your best, do the best you can. If there's a little bit left, hopefully it's gonna be okay. And what about that residual effect? Like you've, you've tried one remedy, then you move on to the other. Is there anything to be aware of there? I'm, I'm following Mouta's book for the cancer on my trees. And sometimes she has one remedy a day and sometimes she says, wait three days and do the next one. So I'm just following her protocol. All right, okay, good. So uh, that's why I recommend these two books. They are packed full of information. Well, speaking of the moth book, oh, uh, Denise wanted to know where you ordered it from. I don't know, you did mention one book, but I don't know if it was the moth book where you ordered it. Do you remember? Oh, where I ordered the, the Mauta book. Oh, it's upstairs. The Mauta book, uh, do you want me to go back to the picture? Yeah, that would be great, if you don't mind. There we are. The Mauta book I got from Toronto. I had received a newsletter from my homeopath's office and uh, it happened to mention about this homeopathy for plants. So I thought, okay, now I know where to get it. I phoned them and, and placed an order. Um, my son-in-law looked for the Cabaraj book on Amazon. That's where he found it. So Mauta might be there too. I don't know. And Elizabeth is mentioning that um... Uh, Narayana Verlag also carries the Mauta book. Yes, both books are, are published by Narayana Verlag, yes. Um, uh, Trish had actually writ uh, written online and she's asking you as well, but, uh, and you had mentioned these both of these remedies, so Coccinella and, um, and Helix Tosta. She's having trouble finding them in Canada and she's wondering where, where, you're, where you're sourcing them. Hmm. Does she get them from Homeocan or not? Has she tried Homeocan? Uh, Trish, if you're there, if you can answer. Oh, and Ananda, Ananda from Riverdale is saying that she thinks that they have both books at Riverdale. So yay, great. Ordering quickly because they're going to go quickly tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said they've used Freeman's in Scotland. I'm pretty sure you can get Coccinella. Coccinella, I, I think I had sent to you, Trish, online that you can get at Thompson's here in Toronto, but I couldn't find Helix Tosta. Okay. Um, see if Homeo can has it otherwise you can get it from uh, Australia office it takes a little while to come yeah, from Australia that was the issue she wanted to get it quicker yeah yeah um 
Now, I don't know common places in the US, like I, I get my stuff from Homeocan or INE Organics. There are a few places in the US as well. Okay. Um, otherwise, ask a homeopath and we can always order it from, or is she a homeopath already? Oh, well, she's writing now. Thanks, Robin. I didn't know that that was you that mentioned Tom's. Oh, yeah, that was me, Trish. Um, so Marilyn's asking you a question directly, Trish, like, um, are you a homeopath? Do you want to, do you need it really quickly? Or can you, I mean, I think she knows to go for, to Helios and, and to Tom's, but I think the idea was to try to have a regular source of it nearby. So the other option, find a snail and toast, <laughs> put a little toast, rub and toast the shell. <laughs> and you make your own remedy, okay? <laughs> it's a great experiment. <laughs> um, Sherry wants to know, um, she, she heard that you said about spraying the leaves, the stem and the ground, but she still didn't hear if you ever water the roots. That means a good drenching. Yes, yeah, so we have two large arbutus trees, which is a West Coast uh, specialty tree that have blight on them and I don't know, 20, 30 feet high, they're really big. So I want to, there again, make another remedy from the diseased leaves. And what I'll be doing is I'll probably spray the trunk and as high up as I can reach with the sprayer, but I'm going to be watering around the base of the trees. That is another specific. A friend of mine in Vancouver, she treated a sycamore tree a few blocks from her house and she would just pour it around the base of the tree, the remedy, and did a great job. Once a year. Amazing. Uh, a yeah, lot of don't forget the base of the tree. Yeah, the, the ground. Don't forget the ground. Oh, that's okay. That's true. Um, uh, since I'm reading it a few times, where can we get Marilyn's book? Do you want to talk a few seconds about that? Okay, I can. Um, get to that slide here. That slide didn't come up. Okay. I guess I'm always not on here anymore. Oh, oh, number three at the beginning. Okay, thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. Okay, we're getting there. There it is. Okay. Yes, this um, started out as a my homeopathic graduation thesis, and then I continued making a lot of little stick people and other other things. There's my. Uh, my stick people, <laughs> you can see it. Um, so I have the only copies there are. I often think about you know, who, who should sell them. Like, like I'm not a, a salesperson, so I don't know <laughs> what to do with some of these. <laughs> yeah, I, make a money. <laughs> I, I have about, I think around 20 or 30 of these books left. Um, so yes, they're, they're $36 Canadian per book. And whatever the shipping charge is, I have a friend who is, said he's certain that he can put it into an ebook as well. Because some of the, I have a call, uh, or email from somebody in Romania, and the, the price to send it to Romania is equal to the cost of the book. So it's, it's a little steep. So we'll see if we can get it made into an ebook, but that won't be probably for a little while yet. Uh, I'm getting so, Sherry. Mains is saying, please contact, this is for you, contact www.trhomeopathic.com to see if they can carry your book. TR, uh, TR, homeopathic.com. So what, what, HTR? No, just TR. TR? Homeopathic, all one word, trhomeopathic.com. And she might be able to carry your book. Okay. Well, they're coming in fast and furious here, folks. I'm going to try to get to, we won't tax <laughs> Marilyn too much longer. Oh my God, now we're up to 22 questions. I don't think I can get them all. Uh, somebody found something at naturereveals.com, Amy said, but I'm not sure which book. I think your book. Uh, Alexa says, um, I heard that Calc Foss is a great soil fertilizer. Do you know? I have. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the Cabarage used to actually test the soils to see what um, weakness the soil had, where it was lacking, and would use the appropriate remedy. If it was lacking iron, he would use ferrum phosphate in the soil then, spray it on the soil. It costs money then to take your lab somewhere and get your soil assessed. 
but because that was his business, he was doing it. Um, thank you. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry to be distracted. I'm trying to get all your questions in. Um, somebody's asking about your slides. Uh, it's something we haven't asked you before. Um, I'm not sure if Marilyn, I don't want to put her on the spot to ask if you're willing to share the slides, but certainly the webinar always can be watched again at forhomeopathycanada.org slash webinars. And you can always look at the uh, presentation again and you can see the slides and you can, you can pause the uh, screen and then you can write down everything. Um, okay, let me ask you, any suggestions for frost treatment, asks Jody. Frost, like cold? Yeah. Um, um, probably an arnica, I would almost think, or if it's plant is really hit hard, then I would suggest even carbo veg. But I don't, I, otherwise, I used to live in the north, but it didn't do homeopathy then. <laughs> so I don't know about frost itself. Uh, it's, uh, maybe somebody else has an answer for that too. I always go to our regular re uh, repertories. Um, Niska wants to know what strength of Kalkfoss as a fertilizer. Oh, low potency in the excess. Do you have any um, formula when to use the lower and when to use the higher? What, what causes you to use either? Um, no, I don't really. Sometimes it come, gets to be a more of a gut feeling. It's, uh, I think today I'll use a low C. Or I think today, I don't usually use the 200 C on plants unless Mount says so. I used more like a 30 C or in the, the X is like um, 12X or something like that, or 30X. So a gut, eh? I think we do that with our patients as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. All right, um, I think uh, I'm just checking to see if there's one more. I think that's it. I'm sorry if I didn't get to everybody, but I, it's hard to, there's so many here. Uh, just one more thing, okay, because this is an interesting one, because you did mention cancer, and we don't think of that one when it's related to plants. So if you could just talk a little bit about cancer and plants. Okay, um, everything in cancer in terms of humans has got an emotion related. Plants might have an emotion too, but they have to express something that is ailing them. That's why we treat the patient, not the disease, okay? So we, we say we can use such and such for cancer, but it, we're treating the patient. And so a cancer is going to grow, maybe there's been a bug and it's the tree's way of, of growing around something to isolate it from the, the rest of the tree. Or there's a splitting of the bark. I don't know why it splits the bark, but I, that, my little Morello cherry tree, we call it the pit tree. It's got the bark split quite badly in two places, but it's got a bumper crop this year because <laughs> I've used some good remedies on it. Yeah, it's so very interesting. It, it's, it's hard to say sometimes just why you use a remedy. Yeah. To what extent do you, you know, uh, uh, you know, the fancy word anthropomorphize, so, you know, that you, you give human characteristics to your plants, to what extent would that translate our, our, our understanding of treating patients into treating uh, uh, plants? That's a hard one because they are so separate. That's, it was my struggle when starting with the agrohomeopathy. Okay, I'm taught about people, but how do I relate that to a plant? But a plant is fixed in one place, so it can't move away from a, a negative stimulus. If it's going to get a lightning strike, well, it's going to get a lightning strike. And so you're, you're, you're going to need a, a, a high potency remedy for that kind of damage that's, that's being done. So it's, it is, it's tough. It's, it's a big transition and how to change from people to plants. Mm. What's that? Yeah, these two books will definitely guide you. Um, Mauta is really great. She has little charts every so often. And, and so for this sim kind of symptom, these are the different remedies that I have found useful. She is really excellent. Thank you. Um, one last question, then we'll let you go from Niska because she's a asked it a few times. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's she or he or they. Um, uh, there was a bug in the pear picture and they want to know what that bug was. 
I don't know what it was. It was just in the picture. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I said. It seemed important. So I wanted to make sure we got it in. Right. <laughs> then, then you wanted these, these slides, didn't you? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I just want to thank you, Marilyn. I mean, everybody stayed, uh, almost everybody stayed right, right to the end. Such an interesting presentation, so different. And uh, we just, we're just so thrilled that you joined us tonight. So thank you. Well, it, I thought everybody needs to have a taste of, of using homeopathy for plants. And then they know whether they wish to do so. But yeah, just another angle of using homeopathy. And nobody can say it's a placebo effect, right? Right, <laughs> because the plants show their results amazingly. I got their pit tree, it was just pits and skin. That's all we were getting. And now it's, it's just flourishing, bundles of blooms, and it's all a little tiny little cherries getting started right now. It's, it's beautiful. I, I, don't it's know, got I, two. I don't know if people had the same reaction I did, but I, I literally gasped when I saw the pictures. How it yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, it's got two big split bark areas in it and it's thriving. Mm -hmm. um, if I could ask you just to go back one slide because it seemed to slip ahead. Here we go. Excellent. So just to remind everybody that we will be uh, continuing to bring you webinars throughout the summer. My uh, lovely uh, colleague Nicole Duelli and I will be doing a six-part series on introduction on um, it's actually on Miranda Castro's book on baby and uh, uh, and mom so uh, we're going to go through pregnancy we're going to go through birth we're going to go through the baby's first year and um, we're going to um, these, these are usually two hour long lectures so we've divided them up into six individual one hour classes so we don't tax you too much because if you have followed me and Nicole and especially me uh, I tend to go on for way too long so we won't torture you because it is summertime we'll try to make it a little bit later. So this is what's coming on up through the summer and you are able to register for them uh, from the emails that we send to you. So we hope to see you there. And remember that even though this is about uh, baby and mom, even though it's about females who are moms, remember the remedies are the remedies. If the mom is hemorrhaging in giving birth, the, the concept of bleeding is bleeding. It doesn't matter if it's in birth or if it's, you know, you can extrapolate it to, uh, to uh, other situations in life. So uh, you don't have to be a, a mom or, you know, or a baby to be watching this. Anyone can watch it and you can under, you can use the same remedies for similar kinds of circumstances. Uh, if I go into the next one. Uh, so uh, we are uh, trying to maintain more of a social presence. Uh, uh, many of you know of us from Facebook. We have our YouTube channel where all of these webinars are actually posted. And if I ever get around to my fear of Instagram, which I don't know why I have it, I will actually be posting some videos on there as well. And we'd like to establish a Instagram uh, presence. Okay, one more. One more slide. And uh, it will, uh, you know, we have to, we have to survive. As I said, we're the little engine that could. We really do this on absolutely no budget whatsoever. And so, anyone who would like to join and become a member, it's only one hundred and twenty dollars a year. Um, you can promote your events. You can publicize yourself. I am going to tell you, everybody, we got over three hundred signups for this course. Now I've been associated with uh, Whole Health Now, I've been associated with Enlightenment Education in, in India. I've been associated with all sorts of different organizations. And I can tell you to get 300 signups for one webinar is astonishing. It is astonishing. And that tells you that For Homeopathy Canada is giving the kind of webinars that people want to attend. But we are all doing this out of the love of our hearts and we don't even, <laughs> Like, I don't think we can even photocopy anything. We don't have a budget for anything. So if you can contribute to us in any way and help to support us, we would very much appreciate it. And also to remind everybody that we're always having these giveaways, these incredible baskets uh, and books on, uh, for homeopathy if you are to give a, a testimonial. So please look for those emails or come to our website for homeopathy.org and submit a testimonial and you will be in the running to win this incredible gift basket that uh, you have almost no competition for. So I would really highly recommend you do that. So I think we're out of time. Marilyn has uh, earned her, uh, her dinner for tonight. <laughs> Let's see who we have up there. What's the name? You just couldn't stay away. <laughs> and 
love when that happens. When I, Miranda Castor was doing a webinar and her cat wouldn't stop meowing. It was very, very cute. <laughs> was very very well behaved so i want to thank everybody for joining us tonight we look forward to remember we're not leaving we'll be here for most of the summer i think we'll take august off but uh and we have so much coming in the pipeline in september as well we're always trying to come up with new ideas i think we're going to be doing some dentistry and we'll definitely be doing some emotions around the pandemic you know people are afraid now to now that things are easing up people might have some residual almost like a ptsd around you know going outside and doing things again so we're going to have a nice webinar on that on that and also and also if there's anything that you'd love us to cover please you know please let us know come to our come to our website and uh, let us know come to Facebook and we'll be very happy to cover that for you you're just you're just 50 slides away from a webinar that you really want to have covered all right everybody I want to thank Marilyn again any last words Marilyn any uh, sage advice well, a big thank you to you and to Nada also Nada was fantastic helping guiding me through little bits and pieces as we're preparing this and you've taken a lot of time here and done a wonderful job thanks so much Thank you. It's because of people like you that we exist and that we can thrive. So thank you so much. So I'm going to say goodnight to everybody and until next time, see you then. Okay. Thanks for all.